Father in heaven, we thank you again uh, for your amazing, truly amazing grace. We thank you because it is indeed amazing that you saw fit to continue our existence just a little while longer. You've been restrained in all of our faults, Father. You've been ever so patient and kind. We thank you this morning for, for, for each and every moment we have to spend with you. We bow our lowly heads now and pray to you, Father, knowing full well that we're entitled to nothing but grim death. But because of your grace, because of your mercy, we're here and we are assembled in your name to learn just a little bit more about who you are and what you would have us to do. To make that time not just time to be spent for our own selfish purposes, to make it valuable time, to redeem the time indeed, Father. I thank you for all who are assembled here in your name. Thank you, Father. Amen. 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 If you were raised with Christ, well, that's a big if. Well, implies the question. You've been raised Amen. with Christ. Amen. And if you were raised with Christ, then that's a big if because it implies oh so much. There's a whole lot that's expected of you. There's some things that have already happened, which is where we left off on last occasion. Let's read our text and we'll pick up right where we set it down last week. Book of Colossians, chapters 3, verses 1, and we'll read through 7. Colossians 3, 1 through 7 says this, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, mm -hmm. where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above. <laughs> if you've been raised with Christ, well, that's a big if. <laughs> Book of Colossians, chapter 3, verses 1. Therefore, if you have been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things that are on this earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of those things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience, and in them you also once walked when you were living in them. So needless to say, again, Paul here writing to the church at Colossae. And if we can, take two steps back and remind ourselves of Colossae, the city, in brief, dealt with a population of Gentiles and, and of course, the Judaizers. So it was being pulled in two different directions, of course. The Judaizers were saying what? The Judaizers are saying that you need to be circumcised. That you need to satisfy the law and all of the right and ritual that is involved in the Judaistic, Judaistic beliefs. Well, of course, the Gentiles were saying otherwise. Gentiles are pagan. Gentiles are not believers. Gentiles were not Jews. And they had any number of fantastic beliefs and pagan rite ritual and everything else associated with worldly beliefs. So the church is being pulled in two different directions and being told to do two different things. We know what Gnosticism is. It is this supposedly higher 
form of uh, belief and understanding that you can only ascend to beyond that of Scripture and things that are hardly attainable, if not even explainable. The church has to hash all of this out and believe the truth, the one thing, the genuine thing. Paul said to the Corinthians, I fear that you have left the simplicity that is belief or your dedication to Christ. Saints, this world today is telling us there's not even an argument in many, in, in many cases. It's not even a discussion anymore. They're not even having a debate on whether or not there is uh, uh, something more than what we see before us. But if you've been raised with Christ, and that's a big if, then you believe the simplicity that is Christ. That all of your faith rests in Him. Church of Colossae, Paul was telling them, if you have been raised, then you continue. I tell you today, church, if you've been raised, don't listen. Oh, you're going to hear it. Oh, you can't deny it. It's so different today, is it not? My mom is, is here, and there are so many things that I didn't see when I grew up, when we were growing up. And the, 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 the rare occasions that we saw it because of the, were because of the rare occasions of the occurrences that, that, that when they happen, whether or not they be in society, whether or not be alternate lifestyles, whether or not be somebody in your family who was, you know, a, a, a rank unbeliever. Nowadays, I've got to take my children and say, come here, look at that. You know what that is? What that is is evil. What that is is satanic. I've got to show them it because they're going to see it every single day. Amen. And I mean every day. Yeah. Every day at school. Right. Every day in the neighborhood. Every day in the grocery store. I can't tell them that, that, that it doesn't exist. Or I can't shield them or I can't not show them because if I don't show them, the world's going to try to teach them and tell them what it is. If you've been raised with Christ, however, it becomes a little clearer. Should I say a lot clearer? You know how to file those things away in the proper category. You know what sin is? Because it's all around you every day. Every single day. And I'm talking about when you wake up. Right? And it'll creep into your dreams, too, by the way. Yeah. Mess around and leave the TV on, right? <laughs> you be dreaming about everything that's on the TV. And happy as you can be when you wake up and realize, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> I am so glad that that is not really happening. Because you've been completed. Because you don't have to be circumcised. Because you've already been buried and you've already been raised. And if you've been raised, that's from Colossians 2, 10 through 12. Let's read it just for context, just as our first reference. Colossians 2, 10 through 12 says this. And again, the implication of the statement is if you've been raised. So in him, if you've been raised, Colossians 2, 10, then you've been made complete. And he is the head of overall rule and authority. And in him, if you've been raised, you were also already circumcised. So the Jewish person telling you you need to be circumcised, you don't need to be circumcised. Paul tells the church at Colossae, you've already been circumcised with a circumcision not made with hands. In the removal of the body of the flesh of the circumcision of Christ. In other words, yeah, that old body was cut away. You remember that old heart, right? Yeah. You remember that old lack of compassion? You remember that old selfishness, I know. He cut it away and replaced it with a fleshly heart. He replaced it with love for people you don't even know. People who don't look like you or act like you, you've never seen, and there is a genuine love and compassion. You know it didn't start with you. 
says you've been buried, and these are the things, again, that have already happened. You're complete. Complete means that, again, you're not wanting of anything. Amen. You're satisfied. Oh, I don't mean your flesh doesn't tell you to go do this and go, go look at that, or when you get hungry, you're not going to really want food. Oh, no, you will. But all of that is tempered. All of that is restrictive. All of that is confined if you've been raised. That's a big if. You've been buried with him, and you've been raised with him through faith and the working of God who raised him from the dead. There's your proof right there. Well, you believe he's in heaven. Where is he in heaven? At the right hand. Already complete, right? Amen. You know what atonement is? Mm -hmm. If you believe, again, that you can lose your salvation, then you don't know what atonement is. Mm -hmm. That means you are already at one with Christ. You've been atoned. That sin has been taken care of. Doesn't mean you have license to go do it. What it means is he knows who you are. He knows how he made you. You've acknowledged him and you've turned it over to him. <coughs> Lord, I want to replace all of those, all of that, all that is me, and I want to replace it with you. And he does just that. Not by your power, but by his. Amen. If you've been raised with Christ. We're still in actually verse 1. Because if you've been raised with Christ, he says, therefore, Colossians 3, 1, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. I want to take this and again in the proper context and the proper order here. Because he says, of course, we need to be seeking the things of God, right? Amen. Subtopic as we begin today is that we need to continue that quest. Paul says, therefore, if you have been raised with Christ, if you've been completed already, if you've already been spiritually circumcised, you are now a Jew spiritually, if you've been raised with Christ, if you've been buried already, then you've been raised, and if you have been, then keep seeking the thing that are above. Heavenly things. If you're of Christ, Paul's implication is that the Christians of Colossae are already in the pursuit of things above. If they're with Christ, the quest then must continue. Because when you got saved, things changed. I didn't say when you saved yourself, should I say when he saved you? When he, I, I tell that parolees are my caseload, I'm a parole agent by trade. It's like, I don't have to, I'm not going to come to your house and talk to you crazy or curse or act like it's mine, but you are subject to search and seizure. Mom and dad have to know that if you're living with them. Okay, so you got to let them know. So sometimes we may be coming with uh, other officers and I tell them, I'm not going to come in that way. I tell them, that, I say, I don't live that way, so I'm not going to come that way. To your, I say, I, 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 have, I have a bunch of equipment, I got handcuff keys, a car, and a quick hook. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to do all of that if you're in violation. And then I take you out of the circumstance that you're in and you're secured in another location. Christ took you out of, he arrested you. Mm -hmm. He took you out of your current circumstance. And he secured you in his secure location. Amen. He has the key. Amen. And it's good that he has the key, right? Because yeah. what would we do if we had the key? Uh -huh. We would reach around the bar, <laughs> unlock the gate, right? Look around, sneak out for the evening, come back and lock ourselves in if we could. <laughs> right? But he has the key. I got a call last night and... Uh, a gentleman was with somebody he wasn't supposed to be with. wasn't a violation, however. I thought it was a very similar name to a caseload that is this one I have. And they arrested him. Then they called back, and I put my hold on. 
So what we have is the county has a hold. That means the cops arrested him. That means Trent's boys went out and they snagged somebody. They called me, right? And they said, well, you're on parole too. Well, they say he was in a car with somebody who had something and she had it in her purse, but as everybody's, because it was an arms, arms, arms reach uh, access, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, I said, well, then put my hold on too, and he hasn't reported. I realized it was not him, and I had to release my hold because they chose to release him because they weren't going to charge him because she admitted that it was in her possession. He wasn't really secure, was he? Mm. That means the circumstances dictated whether or not he stayed or whether he, now he was going to go back to some other. Now, when I get in Monday, he's, that file is on the top of my desk because whether or not he was in violation, he certainly ain't it around. So, I'm going to take that file, and I haven't met him yet. I just got it. I got to turn the pages. I got to make myself familiar with it. The point here is that he was not secured, and the circumstances dictated whether or not he went back and forth and to and fro. Beautiful thing in our circumstances that God arrested us, and he took us out of our current circumstances. Amen. And he secured you. And it's all for your own good. He knows what is good. We don't. We think we know what is good. We know what's good to us. Physically and fleshly and, 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 and for today. He knows what's good for eternity and goes far beyond the flesh. When you get out of here, most of us are thinking what we going to eat for dinner. Right? I often ask Trent and Andrea, especially when they don't have the girls with them, when every one, each one of them is off to school, and I say, wait, 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 talk slow. Tell me where you guys are going to eat. <laughs> right? Because they get to kind of pick and choose. Last time they said, we're, well, last time they said, I think we're cooking today. I said, that's wonderful. But what are you cooking? <laughs> Don't shortchange me here. You can eat whatever you want, but you're cooking for two. <laughs> right? I don't remember the last time I bought a pound of. <laughs> right? Because they're still here. Look at them, the wonderful faces. And they always say, hey, 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 hey. You chose to have us in these numbers. <laughs> Bring on the food. Christ has secured us and Christ has fed us, if we want to use that as well. And he continues to. And if, what kind of food are you wanting? No, we need to continue the quest for the heavenly things. Paul says, therefore, if you've been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things that are above. Remember, in the midst of the prompting from the Jews to go seek that Judaistic thing to go make a sacrifice or to go have yourself circumcised. And of course the pagans, so many other things, right? Ritual sacrifice, the world and your flesh. Go fulfill it. Go fulfill your flesh. Go to Colossians 2.18 if you would. Because the world is telling you today, go fulfill. Go satisfy. And to satisfy or to fulfill, all you have to do is grab your phone and tap, tap, tap. And somebody will bring whatever it is you even ain't supposed to have right to your door. Won't they? Isn't that amazing? Even if it's just information. I forget. We were, oh, we were in training at work and somebody asked something about something or other. And inside of 30 seconds, the trainer had his answer from us who were, oh, no, it says here, this, here. Oh, so why do they call it this? They call it this because of that. It was, it was how you hold a, a certain position in your training when you're entering a room. Some odd little circumstantial thing that did, doesn't mean anything to anybody else, but it's right there at your fingertips. <coughs> Colossians 2.18. Let no one, this is what the world wants to do, let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement the worship of the angels, taking his stand in visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his what? Fleshly mind. So what's in control of his visions? The one that's trying to tell you to go astray. What's in control of, of, of the world and what they want? It is their flesh. They are, Paul said, another occasion. It's like your appetite is the only thing that restrains you. In other words, it's what you want. <coughs> That's what you go get. I'm going to skip down to 20, verse 20. If you have died with Christ, that is a big if. 
If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle or do not taste or do not touch? The world's going to have all of their philosophies, won't they? Even those who are fairly religious. They want to tell you to do this and not do that. And then as a result, you're going to acquire or you're going to uh, gather for yourself a certain amount of knowledge or wisdom or stamina or whatever it is. It's going to tell you to restrain yourself here and to do this and to don't do that. And it's all right and ritual. It has nothing to do with Christ. Do not handle. Do not taste. Do not touch which all refer to things destined to perish with use in, accordance with, the, in accordance with the commandments and the teachings of men. So men have philosophies, don't they? Mm -hmm. Sheree and I were listening to well, something, I believe it was online, to a political commentator, and he was an Afrocentric one, and he made some outstanding political points about the current president and the last president. And they were both in the same light to him. So he wasn't one that was just, you know, lockstep with one because of color and not lockstep. He was saying, well, this one here is this and that one there was that. And he made great political points, especially, the, and a Christian could say, absolutely, that's how I see it. He did this and he does that and this one is that and this one is this. Absolutely. But then he says, well, this is the thing I see for our people, whether it, and it's across time and, and, and a certain and, 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 and any particular location and country and he said and he started out with there's four things I don't remember what two three and four were but the first one he says they're all worshiping a white Jesus so all of a sudden we go from a political commentary to Christ is not your Messiah wow. that's a whole different animal ain't it wow. absolutely and again he told the truth about the political thing Hank Hanegraaff used to say, it's the skin of the truth stuffed with a lie. So he told, he made some truthful statements, but then he went right to the white Messiah that is Christ Jesus. By the way, he's Jewish. Amen. Right? Amen. He ain't European. Yeah. It's Middle Eastern. Yeah. Right? It's a little bit different. <laughs> so again, I had a similar argument way back in high school. When we were uh, uh, on the way to visit a friend in, in uh, college, actually, uh, in, in San Francisco, one of my best friends in the world, and, and his friend who was riding with us was making a similar statement. I said, yeah, but he's Jewish. <laughs> well, it's all the same thing. The argument broke down. The, 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 there is nothing else to put his feet on, so he just went on to the next thing. These are all the whims of men and their own appetites, and their own flesh that has dictated their philosophies. Verse 23 again of uh, second, uh, Colossians, Colossians 2, excuse me, uh, verse 22, which all refer to things destined to perish with, perish with use in accordance with the commandments and the teachings of men. Verse 23, these are matters which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement, and severe treatment of the body. There are people that are so dedicated to getting their body in shape that they think that's the answer to all. Take care of yourself, keep yourself in shape, but that will not give you any kind of extra wisdom, knowledge, or spiritual understanding. It just is good health. Nothing wrong with that. But when you begin to idolize your own, all you got to go to do is go to Instagram, where people have made idols of themselves and their bodies, right? There are people who want to be dolls. There's this thing in plastic surgery, I think it's called body dysmorphia, where you can never be too perfect. And there are people who are actually designing inserts for their body so they can make their pec, pectorals look a certain way. And it's not a muscle, it's a silicon thing and they want to look, I've designed this and I have the doctor slip it in there so that it can look this way and there's, there's this, I don't know why this sticks out. There was a guy, handsome young man in shape 
and he was just obsessed with his calves. And he made an insert for his calf because he didn't like the way his calf looked on the beach. Wow. Y'all like your calves? No. <laughs> so you work on them, right? And what do you do? And if genetics say it ain't going to jump off like that, it ain't going to jump off, is it? Amen. Right? Oh. Exactly. They've been trying to grow hair for a long time, ain't they? <laughs> right? Exactly. I, now I know it's about four people in here that need to say amen. <laughs> right? And I've already said it. <laughs> so, with three. If you've died with Christ, the elementary principles of the world. That's a big if. Are you dead to the world? Are you dead to this world? Yes. All right, amen. Every day, right? Amen. That die has that die, that death has to occur regularly. Now, of course, of course, it already occurred once in the form of your salvation. But the temptation ain't going nowhere. Amen. And when it does rise up, then the risen you needs to rise up, kill the other guy yeah. again, and stay raised. That text ends, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. In other words, all of that is not going to help you restrain yourself for the things that are eventually going to kill you. You guys remember superstitions? I remember in the 70s in particular, there was a lot of superstitions. I just remember growing up as a, as a boy, and there was a lot of superstitions. Not that they're not gone anywhere now, but of course, the 70s coming right off the 60s, I like to say I was a 60s baby, right? I was born in August, on August 3rd, 1969. I mean, I got four months of the 60s, right? I got 69 August, September, October, November, December, I'm sorry, I got five months of the 60s, right? So I'm a 60s baby. That time was supposedly more important, wasn't it? Because you got, what do they call them? The 60s. Right. Bunch of different names, right? The, 60s. the radical 60s. The people from the 60s are called the what? The baby boomers? Yeah. Exactly. And of course, what, what was the great concert that occurred in the 60s? Woodstock. Woodstock. Oh, everybody, you guys remember that. Now you're telling your age, right? All the young people are thinking, Woodstock? You mean Snoopy's Little Bird? No, Woodstock was this incredible concert with a bunch of Lord have mercy. <laughs> They know what all that was. They may not know now, but they'll find out when. As soon as they punch up it, punch it up on their phone. I remember because the 70s coming off the 60s, the 60s was supposedly so much more important. The 70s, of course, was when you know this country and it's and and, and it was all it was radical and, and it was racial and it was coming off of so many more things and we were supposedly heading in the right direction and there was this kind of like continuing enlightenment, if you would. Modern superstitions. Paul was telling these folks at Colossae, don't you yield or heed or listen to these things that are dictated by the minds and the flesh, the flesh of men. And it just reminded me of some of those things. Remember, what is knock on wood? Don't answer that. we got to move on. i got a lot of them here. Mm -hmm. Superstitions. You remember wishing, you wish upon a star? Oh, yeah. I'm taking a shower in my mom's house right before we got married and moved out, and I saw a star. I saw a shooting star. Absolutely, it streaked across the sky in the little bitty shower window, and I'm so I, I just said nobody's there for me to talk about it, and it happens like that. Four leaf clover. Me and Rachel were looking for one the other day because there's some clover at the bottom of my mom's steps at her house, right? And we kind of thumbed through there. We didn't see anyone. Four leaf clovers. Supposed to be good luck. Right? Breaking a mirror? How many years? Seven. Seven years <laughs> bad, luck. bad luck. Seven years bad luck. And again, it, 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 I know some folk here from Louisiana. That's where it all comes off. I'm not going to put it all on them, but a lot of folk believe that, right? By the way, broken mirror, seven years bad luck. And a lot of times they say, well, how many pieces was it, right? Okay, after you break the mirror. To cure that, you know what you're supposed to do? 
this was my study, and we're going to have a little fun with this. So you take the broken mirror so you can eliminate the bad luck, and you have to go bury the broken mirror in the moonlight. <laughs> Superstition, right? Yeah. We're ascribing power to these things, aren't we? Yes. Bad news comes in threes. Mm -hmm. Find a penny, pick it up. All the day you'll have good luck. Have good luck. <laughs> Seems harmless, don't it? It's just a penny and I want good luck. Do not open an umbrella inside the house. Right? And your grandmother twice removed, great, great, if you did that, she would beat you with that umbrella and don't you open that umbrella in this house. Right? Now that makes sense because if you open an umbrella in the house, you're going to knock something over. Probably. Right? You're going to break somebody's crystal. Right. Well, yeah, that's bad luck because, yeah, because can't nobody, the child can't pay for the crystal. Beginner's luck. Right? Simple. Well, you're winning because you're the beginner at the game we're playing. Crossing your fingers, real simple, right? You cross your fingers for good luck. Walking under a ladder. Right? Now, the simple form of that, you walk under, why wouldn't you walk under a ladder? Because something might Something's probably working. Somebody's probably working on the ladder. Something might fall. There's something a little bit deeper. We'll talk about that in a minute. You sneeze. What do people say? Bless you. That one seems okay, right? Talk about that one in a minute. A wishbone. Oh, I used to fight for it. Right? Thanksgiving coming up. And you, who, who, who wins? The shorter, the shorter, the bigger. No, the guy who gets the one who gets the the little the hook on the top, yeah. right? He's gonna have the good luck, and whoever got the short end, well, of course you got the short end of the bone or the stick, and you got the bad luck. Spilled salt. What do you do? Take a pinch. The boy's shoulder. Left shoulder, right? Some say right, some say left. Horseshoes. This was interesting to me. And this came from, when was the last time you seen a horseshoe walking down the street? Well, some areas, we, I had to go to Paris just the other day for a basketball game Friday night. It, I seen a whole lot of horses, right? And I, if I walked long enough, I probably would find a horseshoe. Horseshoe, you know, if you found a horseshoe, it's supposed to be good luck too, right? In particular, if you find the horseshoe and the opening of the horseshoe is facing towards you. Also, you put the horseshoe on top of your door. You're supposed to put the horseshoe with the open end up so that everybody in the house will be filled with the horseshoe with all the good luck that collects in the horseshoe. Wow. This was my study. You guys have to listen to it. I had to study. <laughs> Do you know there's something about making a wish at 11, 11 o'clock? Yeah. See, the young people know that. All other people say, like, huh? I didn't know that. But they have stuff on their phones, and I'm sure somebody has made an app or a poster or something to remind that it's 11-11 and for them to make a wish. So when it strikes 11-11, you're supposed to make a wish, and the wish is supposed to come true, I guess. Fortune cookies. Simple. Every day. Voodoo. Here we go, Louisiana folks. Right? They make the doll. Right? I know my family's from Texas, so I didn't say that. So. No, absolutely. Texas, Texas, big. It's a whole bunch of that stuff, right? Yeah. And you see the doll with the pins in it, right? It's a whole bunch of movies and a whole bunch, a whole industry on Voodoo. Yeah. Ouija boards and all the like. Itching palms. Money. 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 Left hand, right. you're going to lose it. Right hand, you're going to get it, right? You're supposed to scratch it? No. 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 Absolutely, right? You don't scratch. You're supposed to scratch it. I remember this one because I had a couple of them. Seventies, hanging from your keychain. What did you have? Rabbit's, rabbit's foot. Rabbit's foot. <laughs> Shame on you, Christian folks. The lucky rabbit's foot, right? Yeah. You talk about a whole industry. I mean, because you used to buy with the different colors, right? Yeah. Used to be at every liquor store in the neighborhood, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And when yours got ugly or dirty or you dropped it in the mud, you went and got another rabbit's foot. Yeah. Yeah. And you hung it from your keychain. And then again, it's a three-legged rabbit walking around saying, I don't know why they believe in you. <laughs> Black cat, of course, crossing your path. Yeah. Just got done with Halloween. The unlucky number? 13. 13. Many hotels don't have a what? 13th floor. 
right? Many airlines or, or airplanes don't have a 13th row. Really? Really? Your ears are burning. <laughs> Guys are on it. We did Friday the 13th. Don't step on a crack. Break your mama's back. <laughs> Why is that funny? <laughs> I've been waiting for that one. <laughs> Step on a crack, break your mama's back. Mm -hmm. And there were people, there are people still who will walk down the street. Step over. Yeah. Right? If they walk under a ladder, what will they do? Walk around. Double back, go back around. Mm -hmm. Right? Because they believe in or they ascribe some kind of power to these things that have none. Dogs howling. It's a bad omen. Dog or a wolf. How you start your year is how you will end it. We're coming up to a new year. Of course, the whole New Year's resolutions, right? Mm -hmm. Shoes on the table bring bad luck. Mm -hmm. Come on, somebody said, no, that's just nasty. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they say it's going to bring bad luck because you're going to die from whatever you yeah. stepped in when yeah. you yeah. eat it. <laughs> so that ain't bad luck, that's just nasty. Absolutely. <laughs> Purse on the floor. <laughs> exactly. And ladies, y'all don't put your purse on the floor, do you? Not usually. Right? Exactly. They, they're, again, the industry, there are hooks now. Yeah. Right? Table hooks and chair hooks. So that you, you, you don't have to rest on the floor. Don't know if it has anything to do with that. Owls howling, of course. Owls hooting and howling. Kind of probably just like the dogs and the wolves howling. And bad luck or somebody will die. A bird in the house. Uh oh. You, you know them all. Is a sign of death. Oh, really? A bird in the house. Well, they ain't supposed to be in the house, right? It's a sign of death because the bird going to die if he don't get out of my house. Right? What is a wild bird? Not a house yeah, exactly. Of course, a wild bird. If you say oh, yeah, you walk in, you know, and you see the chickadee or a pigeon like flying inside, and it's kind of like that ain't right. Mm -hmm. no, it's not right, but I don't know if there's any power there. I do know. Now, many of these things we thought of as harmless, or we think of as harmless, but not so when we're ascribing power or making decisions based on these foolish notions. Mm -hmm. Right? I just remember it was a lot stronger then. There was a lot more. I mean, when you were, when I was growing up and these things were a little more prevalent, especially when you had the rabbit's foot. And I didn't ascribe any power to it in particular, but I wanted one. Yeah. And I had one. One or two. Many of these things deal with dark places and religions, and we have some examples. I told you we were going to get back to walking under a ladder. Of course, Common sense, don't walk under a ladder because the dude painting on the ladder, his can of, can of paint might drop on you and you get hurt. But, a little deeper, the shape of the ladder, this is where some of this comes from, is a triangle, which signifies in some mythologies life, right? You know, the triangle symbol also with the, what is the thing that all the, uh, the celebrities do? Illuminati. The Illuminati, right? Oh. They have the triangle on the back of our dollar bill. There's a triangle right. at the top of the pyramid with eyeball in it, right? Right? Yeah. So, give me all your money, because y'all don't want to mess with that. <laughs> I'm kidding. You walk through the ladder, it's thought that you tempt fates, and you also run the risk of awakening spirits that live in the triangle, because yeah. of the shape of the ladder. Including evil, evil spirits with may, which may not be happy with you disturbing them. So if you do accidentally walk under a ladder, you can counteract the bad luck by placing your thumb between your index finger and middle finger and holding it there for at least five seconds. Or cross your fingers on both hands while calling upon the sign of the cross to protect you from evil. That's some Louisiana foolishness, ain't it? <laughs> Absolutely. And again, notice that they blended the cross in there, correct? Right? Saying God bless you after people sneeze. 
That's the one I thought about, right? Because your heart stops and of course Satan got a chance to get in or whatever. You can, you can fill that gap with anything, right? For some, of course, in good manners, pure and simple, but blessing someone after he or she has sneezed is actually common superstition. In the 6th century Europe, people congratulated anyone who sneezed. They believed that the person was expelling evil spirits. In early Roman culture, Believe that the strong sneeze could release your soul into a world and a, uh, and a bless you would bring it safely home. Wow. More historically, the Black Plague hit Europe in 1665, also known as the... Oh, yes. <laughs> that was my kid. The Black Plague or the Bubonic Plague. Where did it come from? Right. Man, rats on Absolutely, rats. 1665, the Pope required everyone to be blessed when they sneeze. The Pope required everybody to be blessed when they sneeze because he believed that a sneeze was a sign of the person that would surely soon die of the plague. Blessing, blessing was usually followed up by making the sign of the cross for good measure. So now we blended the cross with all of these other foolish, fantastic ideas and notions. You know what that's called? Idolatry. <laughs> when you ascribe power to a thing that has none, right? Yeah. And of course you've mixed it with the cross. It's no different than what they did when they went up the mountain, right? Came back with the tablets, and what were the people doing? What had, what had they made? Yeah. A calf. But they said, they didn't say the calf has power. They said we made a calf uh, as a sign to God the Father in heaven. Whoa, 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 whoa. So now you're making things, but you're making it for a true God. When you try to use the true God, ascribe him power, sign, symbol that he, he does, he will not, that he does not ascribe to, that you are suddenly involved in idolatry. That's what they were doing. So, again, and, and we know it from Catholic culture as well, the rosary that's hanging with they, that they believe has power from, from, from the rearview mirror, is idolatry in, in the cross. So we need to be very, very careful. Turn to 2 Corinthians 6 and 14. We said again, because a lot of these things are, come from very dark places. I'm going to read it just to save time. Do not be bound together with unbelievers for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? And what fellowship has light with what? Darkness. Darkness. You dabble in darkness. Dark people and dark places and dark, uh, their priorities are going to be dark. It's going to be dark. Meaning, ain't no light. Right. Meaning, that you're going to find yourself wandering and lost and not satisfied and not behaving like those who are supposed to be raised up with Christ. And that's a big if, seeking those things above. Of course, Paul was addressing these things, and they were far more serious, if you would, than just a few uh, what we may call harmless superstitions. He was addressing it because the false teachers, whether pagan or Jew, were denying the truth of the gospel of Christ. If I am saying that this thing has power and will affect my life because I walk under this or because I broke that, then I am saying, Christ, you don't have as much power as this thing. At least not in this circumstance. It's related to what we often, or the doctrine known as, again, to continue. Because what does Paul say here to Colossae? If you've been raised in Christ, then you keep seeking the things that are above. Then you continue to seek the things that are in heaven. Then you, there must be an endurance even in the midst of all of these things, Colossae and Los Angeles and wherever you live, that are pulling you in how many different directions telling you that you're going to be satisfied one way or the other in all of these different places by all of these different pe people doing all of these different things. Paul says, no, there's simplicity in Christ Jesus and you keep seeking the things above, which is where he is. 
Your affection is on him, and where he is are the things that you need to be seeking. So keep focused on him and his abode, where he resides. And what's where he resides? Heavenly things. Paul's saying, continue it. Persevere in it. Endure in it. Gives us a chance to discuss John Calvin's tulip again. John Calvin, theologue from antiquity, of course known for his tulip or Calvinism. Tulip is the acronym, we've talked about it piecemeal before. T is for what? Total depravity. Total depravity. The U in tulip is for unconditional election. The L is for limited atonement. atonement. The I is for irresistible grace. grace. And the P, which we'll discuss briefly, is the perseverance of the saints. The best, if you might, if you would, supporting scripture for that comes from Philippians 1 and 6. Turn to it quickly. The book is Philippians, the chapter is 1, the verse is 6. I'll read it quickly for the sake of time. Philippians, first chapter and 6 verse says, talking about the perseverance of the saints. For I am confident of this very thing that he who has began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. That is if you've been raised with Christ, right? Because there's a lot of folks claiming, but everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. There's a lot of people talking about heaven ain't going there. There's a lot of people that may claim Christ. There's a lot of people that are sitting in church that don't belong to Christ. But if You've been raised with Christ. That's a big if. If that is real or, 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 or if the veracity of your salvation is found to be pure and true and correct and sincere, then you can be sure that what he began in you will continue. And it will continue until the day of Jesus Christ. R.C. Sproul says this. Really good. He cuts it up into simple bite-sized pieces. And even his some of his longer notes on things aren't very long. Because I don't think sometimes you need six pages of something to understand it. Mm -hmm. There are some doctrines that you need to chop up piece by piece and subtopic by subtopic. He does a good job handling the tulip. He says, writing to the Philippians, Paul says, He who has begun a good work in you will perfect it to the end. That's again Philippians 1 and 6. Therein is the promise of God that what he starts in your souls, he intends to finish. So the old axiom in Reformed theology, and we are Reformed, about the perseverance of the saints is this. If you have it, that is, if you have genuine faith, if, if you have faith, and if that faith is genuine, then you are in a state of saving grace. And you'll never lose it. That's simple and to the point, isn't it? Don't you love it when you hear it as you know it and believe it? It's kind of like I could have said those same words, but when it's preached to you or when it's, when it's put in proper order of the doctrine or the text, and it's taken in context and it's saying, wait a minute, now I can plant my feet a little bit firmer. Why? Because I can persevere and I don't have to do what those people do. I don't have to be as the world is. I, can, I, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I didn't start this. That he changed me. And I can't lose it. Because if I had the key, I would open the door this evening, run out. Come back in and try to tell God, I've been here all night, Lord, I'm yours. You are in a state of grace. You will never lose it. And if you lose it, you never have it. Y'all read this too? Absolutely. Sproul also states, he prefers the term preservation of the saints because perseverance implies or may imply that you may be doing something. 
that you're persevering. He prefers the term per preservation of the saints uh, because the process by which you are kept in a state of grace is something that is accomplished by God and not by you. Right? Amen. Absolutely. Thus, what God has begun in you, he will most certainly finish and bring all of his own to heaven. You belong to him? Amen. And if you've been raised, well, Christ was raised, right? Amen. Where is he? Amen. In heaven. If I've been raised, where am I going to be? Amen. In heaven. Paul, again, simply exhorting us to continue to seek the eternal in the midst of the claims of the false teachers and preachers and the pressure and the persecution to deny or recant your profession of faith. Paul saying, y'all don't do that. Continue, continue, continue the quest for the things that are above. Stay. Don't move. Hold on. Don't let go. Hold on and don't let go. My sister-in-law sang that song. Like, uh, her name is Nancy, my brother's wife. And Nancy's voice is high. Mm -hmm. And when she sings it, she's got a little whine where she would say, hold on. I, 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 oh, no. Yeah, it was that bad. <laughs> <laughs> that was bad. No. Except, but she, when she does it, and I, it just rings in my head, and she would say, hold on and don't let go. Don't let go. Hold on and don't let go. Saints, hold on. Hold on. Because if you've been raised, then he'll finish it. Yeah. You just got to not let go. And even when your grip gets loose, then you know, wait a minute, I'm weak, he's strong. Amen. He started it, he going to finish it. Then you got a little more strength to hold on, don't you? Then you got a little more, 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 more power to persevere. That power didn't come from you either. This is accomplished, of course, through all trials and all tribulations and all situations and all circumstances. Hold on. Amen. Persevere. Don't change. And if you have, turn around. Go back to where you know you are secure. John, and again, this perseverance of the saints. His part is to secure you. Your part is to continue. Paul says, continue the quest. Paul says, keep on searching and keep on seeking and keep on looking for and keep on making those things that are in heaven because you are secure. You can make those things the focus of every single day of your life. You've got to go to work. Find a heavenly focus at work. You've got to go home. Make that the most heavenly place you got. Get rid of all the foolishness. And all the funny stuff, and all the stuff that's going to distract you. John 2, 19. First John, should I say, 2 and 19. This idea that the Christian continues, that the Christian doesn't change and doesn't let go, or if and when he does, he gets right back to it. He don't stay there, right? Absolutely. He doesn't keep on going. We've taught, we, we always kind of make reference to backsliding, right? Backsliding. If you've been backsliding for, for like eight years, you probably ain't saved. You can't just say, well, yeah, I'm saved, but I'm just backsliding right now. If you're smiling while you're saying it, wait a minute. I'm just doing my thing right now, but I'm saved. I'm just backsliding. No, you front slide. That's where you always go, right? Exactly, because that implies that you're going to come back or that you're doing things, you've turned your back. No, no, that's not where you're turned. You've been going that way. You're, I'm actually going that way. I'm just backsliding right now. How long does the backsliding continue before it is not just who you are? Before we can say, again, that's a big if. You just ain't been raised. 1 John 2.19 says, they went out from us, but when they were not, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have what? Continued with us. There's a bunch of folks that's 
that's chasing Christ, that's seeking Him, that's setting their affections on Him. That's our second verse, actually, to set your affections on things above. It's a bunch of folks that are still searching and seeking and setting their affection. And it's some folks that started out on that road and then they left. And they ain't came back. This verse is talking to them, saying that if they were with us, well, but they were not of us, but if they had been of us, but if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be manifest that none of them were of us. Mm -hmm. In other words, it was designed to show you what? That there will be those amongst you that are not of you. That's what that is saying. It says, they would have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest, that it might be made known to you that there will be those who only are making a confession. One of the evidences is that you may not be able to tell at first, but you're going to wonder where they at after a time. They ain't coming back. You're going to pass them when you pass by them old places, or those old people, or you get word. Don't be, don't, 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 don't keep on backsliding, y'all. <laughs> Come on back. 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 13. 2 Timothy. Well, if you found one of the T's, you found all of the T's. Timothy, Titus, and Thessalonians. And so we got 2 Timothy, second chapter. Verse 11 through 13 says this. This is a faithful saying. For if we died with him. This ain't even my text. But that's a big if, ain't it? Because if you died with him, then we shall live with him. Read it again. 2 Timothy, 2nd chapter, 11th verse. It is a faithful saying. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, verse 12, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. Deny us. Yeah. If we are faithful, faithless, listen to this part. If we are faithless, you might not want to think, he's going to be faithful. No. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. Amen. Isn't that encouraging? Amen. So when I mess up, Lord have mercy, he's still there to take me. All I got to do is turn around. He's going to be faithful. He cannot deny himself. That means that he knows what you're doing. He knows that he has those that have exemplified faithlessness. But he can't be faithless. He remains faithful. And he cannot deny himself. You guys know the story of Polycarp? Yeah. Who doesn't? Who doesn't know who Polycarp is? Raise your hand. Good. Polycarp was a martyr, and he was the Archbishop of Smyrna in the second century. Roman church. Faithful man. Agent. Polycarp is known for making this statement. He says, 86 years I have served him and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme? How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? Polycarp, the Roman proconsul, was making martyrs of those who were faithful to the cross and faithful to Christ. And he sent out his troops, and they had collected a few. Many of them turned themselves in, and they were martyred. How did the Romans do it? In the Colosseum. Amongst the lions. Or at the stake to set them on fire. Polycarp, 86 years old. In the least, by the way. Actually, he was likely older because in a letter where, where his story is gleaned from, and it was, these letters were from the church at Smyrna, and they were compiled and they were passed out through the region to these other churches to tell the story of Polycarp. 
So as the Roman soldiers were seeking this famous, this man famous for his faith, some of his loved ones, some of those that followed, and he was a, uh, a disciple of John, by the way. John, uh, the, beloved. the beloved, thank you, the disciple. So as they were searching for him, he was not going to leave, but they convinced him to leave, saying, wait a minute, they've killed others, they're going to kill you. He left and went to the, uh, a neighboring town, to, the, to friends' homes. And they couldn't find him. And they took two men from his own home. And they tortured them until they gave up the information. So then they made their way, the soldiers did, so that they can grab him and take him to the arena and the way it's told, don't know the veracity of that if it happened exactly like when they grabbed him, they took him straight to the arena, but that's how the story is told. He eventually, in other words, was led to the arena. But when they, before they led him to the arena, they were searching for him, he was at one place and then he left and went to another place. And when I heard that, see, I thought, wait a minute, Polycarp just stood and left and went. No, it makes it real. That wait a minute, whether it for fear or from the prompting of friends, he left because he was going to die. Anybody in here want to die? Whoa, 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 don't answer that. Anybody in here want to go to heaven? Amen. Right? Anybody in here can't wait to get to heaven? Anybody in here want to go to death? It's like, hold up. <laughs> wait, 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 how are we getting married? Right? I mean, we just going to take a trip? So we're going to charter a bus? We're going to go visit? Right? Y'all want to go today? Because how you get to heaven? You got to die to get to heaven, right? Exactly. Unless, of course, and I remember this as a young man. Unless, of course, wait a minute, everybody's not going to die. People would always say, because everybody's going to die. And I said, I know everybody's not going to die. Because if I make it to the trumpet, I ain't going to die. Right? Exactly. So now, if that's the answer, well, yeah, I go today if Christ is coming back today. Yeah, let's go. Right? Because then, yeah, everybody want to go in, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Polycarp, I like that part of when I was researching this just several years ago. I was like, wait a minute, I didn't know that part. I don't know that he recanted or anything at that point, or that, but it, it, was, it made it real that he left for sake of fear or the prompting of his friends, and he went to a location, and he was on the run for a minute. And they were searching for him, knowing that he was going to die. So you got the Roman soldiers that are seeking him actively. And he goes from one location to another. And from one location to another, then he stops after they uh, got the two men that they tortured and they told where he was. And he was upstairs and apparently in some loft area, tucked away. And they actually said he could have left again. But he said, nope, the will of God be done. So when they came in and he came downstairs and it says that the soldiers were in awe of this strong man, stately, but at his age. And that he was so clear minded and intended to come down and greet them. He called for his, <coughs> those people that were in his service to immediately serve the men that were there and actively seeking him. Because he knows, of course, they, they don't get to go eat and sleep until they get their job done for the Roman proconsul, right? If, if, if the governor of Rome or the, 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 the location that has sent out those soldiers, they can't go back about their business until their job is done. So he probably knew that they were weary that they were weary and sleepy and tired and, and emaciated and he told those in his service, go get them some food and feed them and if you can wait just for an hour, I'd like to pray before you take me. So he prayed for an hour. He couldn't stop. They say pray for two hours. Wow. Then after he was done, put him on a donkey. It says they marched him to the arena. In other words, what happened was they must have been sending messengers back and forth. And of course, the Roman council would likely want them to know I got my man. <coughs> so we assembled everybody in the arena. <coughs> and then a messenger goes back and says we got him. And they take him to the arena on the donkey. Just would like to read some of it as we get to that point in the story. As he talks to the proconsul, to the Roman governor, he 
says to Polycarp, have respect for your old age. In other words, look here, old man. Mm -hmm. You're going to die today unless you do what I say. Have respect for your old age. Swear by the fortune of Caesar. Repent and say, down with the atheist. Atheists. Sounds like a funny statement, right? Mm -hmm. But he was saying, of course, telling him to call those people who believed in Christ or those people that didn't believe that who was God? Caesar. 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 Right? So what he's saying, he's saying, look, you call those people, your people, atheists. The story goes, Polycarp looked grimly because the crowd was at a furor. The crowd was just all out of sorts because they wanted blood. Polycarp looked grimly at the wicked, heathen multitude in the stadium and gesturing towards them, he said, down with the atheists. <laughs> So, Mr. Governor, I've said what you told me to say. The council says again, Reproach Christ and I will set you free. Polycarp retorts again, 86 years I have served him, Polycarp declared, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? Polycarp had left for a little while. He was on the run for a little while. Then he came back and said, the will of God be done. The governor says, the Roman governor says, I have wild animals here, and I will throw you to them if you do not repent. Repenting is a Christian doctrine, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But of course, he's talking about repenting from his uh, diatribes against Caesar and in favor of Christ. Polycarp says to your lions, uh, call them. It's unthinkable for me to repent from what is good to turn to what is evil. The governor says, ah, if you despise animals, I'll have you burned. <laughs> you threaten me with fire, which burns for an hour, Polycarp says, and then is extinguished. But you know nothing of the fire of the coming judgment and eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. Yeah. Why are you waiting? Bring on whatever you want. He says, you choose. If it be animals and lions and beasts, so be it. If it be fire, that's your choice. When the fire was prepared, it says that the crowd, they all gathered as many uh, dry pieces of wood as they could. It says they went from storage rooms to bathhouses to everything, and they got everything together. And Polycarp says, no need for your nails. They simply bound him, and he stood there at the stake. Needless to say, he would usually have been fastened to it and unable to move. As they lit the fire, it says, as the story goes, it says, and the writer says, it was if uh, the winds uh, had been billowing against the sails of a ship, how it creates the arc in a ship, and the fire curled around him and did not burn him. Mm. He didn't die from the fire. Wow. So everybody's standing there and watching and in awe. It says, Polycott took off his outer clothes, undid his belt, Ty uh, tried to take off his sandals, and of course then everybody was trying to rush him because they want to be the ones to touch him, all his supporters. And what he finally says is, leave me as I am, for, what, uh, for he that gives me strength will endure the fire. For, for me to endure the fire will enable me not to struggle without the help of your nails. O oh, Lord God Almighty, he prayed, Father, of your beloved and blessed Son, Jesus Christ, he continued, by whom we have received the knowledge of you for uh, the God of the angels, powers, and every creature, and all of the righteous who live before you. He continued, to you, with him, throughout the Holy, through the Holy Ghost, be glory and honor forever. They lit the fire. Fire did not burn him. And he was killed when the council, and they saw it, 
said it looked not like the flesh that was to be burned, but like bread that was to be baked. That's what he looked like. And not until the council says, go end it, somebody ran up and stabbed him. And he died not by fire, but by dagger. Continue. Saints continue. Even until the day, whether we make it to the trumpet, or the way this country's going, we're going to see those that are going to be martyred. Very likely, if not in my lifetime, maybe in some of your lifetimes. Don't know. I was listening to MacArthur this morning, and he says the direction and the pace at which I don't know if we're going to be able to sustain. It's alarming, but when you hear such stories, absolutely amazing, and it gives you strength. Strength to, as Paul said, continue to seek the things that are above, where your Savior Jesus Christ is, in heaven at the right hand of our Heavenly Father, God, <coughs> from whom we draw all every ounce, every iota of our strength, saints. Amen. Be strong and continue. Amen. Amen. Father in heaven, we thank you for your blessed word for even just an hour. We are full, full of wisdom, knowledge, which grows deep down inside us into strength and strength for it today. I pray for these young people who will see things that we never, we would have never thought possible in our culture, Father. But I also pray for those who have seen much in times past and are seeing things that they have never seen in today's times. We all need strength this morning, Father. Continue to strengthen us. We thank you. Amen.